Have a seat, everybody, please. So we are quite late in time, but at the end, so we get to the medical part and to the applications. So initially we have two talks from the industry, who show new developments. And I would like to, I'm happy to present Vanessa Di Pasca. She's from Nano Dick Bio, and she presents the microcontroller and new enrichment technology. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining me to my talk today. Um, so uh, I'm going to start just giving you a quick overview of our company, because I'm assuming no one ever heard about Nanodyne Bio before, and just showing you our technology works, what makes the difference, um, and just giving you an application example using our AML enrichment panel. So uh, you haven't heard about us because we're headquartered in China and just uh, recently started sales in the big wild, wide world. Uh, we have uh, our R&D and GMP manufacturing facilities in Nanjing, which is kind of close to Shanghai, if you're not familiar with China. And we're just setting up our new Singapore facilities, basically just to make export easier of our products um, to overseas. And our product portfolio covers everything from NGS workflow, except the actual sequencers. So we have library preps for Illumina and obviously MGI. So we've been partnering with them a lot in China. Uh, we offer different solutions for hybrid capture, um, but also automation and bioinformatics solutions. So just a few pictures of our labs. Um, we synthesize our own oligos uh, in-house. Um, I'm not a GMP standard, but also just in our standard labs. Uh, we do uh, individual synthesis and also all the QC, including uh, the final NGS validation in-house. And have a big team of roughly 120 people in our uh, company, so we can cover and support you uh, with different questions from wet lab to automation um, to the actual data analysis. And I'm your local support. I'm actually based in Dusseldorf uh, and I'm uh, yeah, the, the head of sales for the uh, EMEA region. So all of Europe, Middle East and Africa. Just to show up a little bit, so <laughs> we own quite a few patents. We have some software copyrights um, and also some registered trademarks. Also, our new technology is patented currently in China. The new color technology, so that's why what we called it. Um, the point was why was this developed is if you're looking at small panels for or small targets to look at a NGS basis, you would usually go for amplicon sequencing just because hybrid capture is just terrible. Like with on target rates below 20%, you're just filling up your sequencer with lots of useless data. And also the whole workflow is quite of, uh, complex and laborious. So that's why a lot of people switch to amplicon sequencing. Depending on the sequences you actually want to look at, it's maybe not the best solution. You're introducing lots of bias. So especially when it comes to more clinical applications, that will definitely get very difficult. So we wanted to find a solution to still use hybrid capture to keep this nice sensitivity, but still be able to use it with very small panels. So that's how we developed this Mucolor technology. So it's still hybrid capture as you might use it from uh, know it from the standard baits that are being used, biotinylated. But instead of just having one individual bait just binding to one target sequence, um, the the baits are somewhere between 20 to 100 nucleotides. So they may completely vary in sizes and they form these kind of like daisy chains. Um, where they have regions that they can hybridize to each other and therefore stabilize the whole system even further. So as I mentioned, we currently have our Chinese patent. Uh, we're waiting for our uh, global patents to be granted. So that's why we're not really displaying a lot of details about the design, uh, but definitely be able to like give you the bad file so that you know which targets are being targeted. Um, as uh, for the whole system, 
we offer not just like the, the actual hybrid capture, uh, but also starting from library preparation uh, and using UMIs uh, for best sensitivity and just the fastest protocol to go for um, different analysis as I will mention later, AML. Um, I'll just walk you through some of the benefits that the system brings. So we have a very stable capture quality, which is very important. And then if we're going into different panel sizes that, as I mentioned, were kind of almost impossible to use before with just standard hybrid capture, um, we basically get on target rates that are very much above 80%. So we're looking here at uh, just uh, one standard um, panel that is 8.5 KB in size. Um, and we just tested different types of uh, our DNA. Obviously, you know, we're a commercial company, so we're just using the standard um, GDNA samples that you can get, like in this case from Promega. But also if you compare it with different panel sizes, so here the panels, they range from 3.2 KB um, to uh, up to 58 uh, KB. So 58 is actually a little bit beyond what we recommend. Um, just very simply, like above 50 KB, the benefits are not really too much compared to standard um, hybrid capture. And just the standard baits are cheaper. So that's why we say don't use our me caller system for panels above 50 KB. Uh, we have different ranges in uh, GC and uh, as you can see, we still have very nice data for all the different panels that we used here. Also for the low background noise, or to reduce that, um, I don't think I have to go too much into detail here about using UMIs. Um, that brings you just uh, an extra step, um, cleaning up your DCS. But we also developed a new a fragmentation module. So we compared it to just conventional um, enzyme fragmentations that are being offered, uh, where we see one point that it can actually introduce some bias that you won't be able to filter out using M uh, UMIs because it obviously happens before you add the adapters to your library prep. Um, we also compared the standard sonication where uh, we see that with the breaks that happen within the DNA, um, you actually get rid of these ends of your fragment at the end when you convert the library. So to get rid of this problem, we develop two different kind of uh, endonucleases that give you these really nice, very uh, equal cuts across uh, your DNA that is being used. And so we have like this high integrity of the fragment ends, but also very high conversion rate of the library. So that's how as that we compared here now just using um, a Covaris shearing and our new NEM module uh, with different um, amounts of DNA, um, but also seeing that the consistency is very stable um, across different batches that we use, which is also very important. And last but not least, it's a very fast protocol. Um, so we have optimized the different wash steps in between the hybridization time. So basically the total hybrid capture can be cut down to only 2.5 hours. If you take into account some additional library prep before and after, you can easily do you know, you set up within one day and just put the samples on the sequencer. So um, as an example, um, as I mentioned, we now have different panels kind of off the shelf for our me caller, but we can create any kind of custom panel that you want. Um, our AML panel is roughly 42.5 KB in size. And to just demonstrate uh, how well it works, uh, we use, again, some standards, uh, reference standards um, that we mix in different ratios just to mimic different uh, allele frequencies. And here, just some standards from the sequencing run um, that we can see what is the on-target rate, mappability, 
stability, depth of coverage. Um, so sequencing this on a NovaSeq 6000. And then looking at the mutations that we know are in the samples that we use, calculating the theoretical mutation frequency and therefore the duplex reads that are needed to uh, confirm these uh, frequencies. Uh, we did two repeats and had a look at these five different genes. Uh, and you can see that the data very much specifies the allele frequency that has been calculated beforehand. So as a summary, we just tried to make a hybrid capture for small panels, A, feasible, and B, just more convenient, faster, um, and especially more stable within lot to lot, and also uh, for different users to not include too many steps so that you can reduce the errors in there. So that's my quick introduction. Um, if you've got more questions, I'm open now. Thank you, Vanessa. I... <laughs> so I think now genomic diagnosis, especially in uh, oncology, has been widely established, and the patients and also the treating physicians becoming more and more impatient. You know, they want to have the result as soon as possible. So time matters, and the enrichment is was quite a time waster in the past. So questions for Vanessa. I'm happy to talk to you. So I've got a booth here around the corner. So feel free to stop by, I can show you more data. Yeah. So one question, do you think you can also enrich entire exons? Would that be feasible and also save time because- On, on, on the exon? Yeah, do you plan to- yeah. Metagenomics or exome enrichment kits as well in future? Yes, so we also offer this. Uh, so we have our traditional hybrid capture system, which you know is an overnight hybridization and literally takes you two hour, uh, two days just to do uh, the actual hybrid capture. But uh, we have a new system that cuts it down to those uh, two and a half, three hours of uh, hybridization. Mm -hmm. okay. And also the cost is also an issue because the capture sequencing has become quite, on the short term sequencing, quite economic, but the enrichment was still <laughs> costly. So. I mean, it, it obviously depends on the panel that you want to use, the targets, like on a target, how many probes we have to synthesize. Uh, but let's say like a standard sample, I guess the most expensive still is like the exome panel. Um, and that gets you easily below 45 euros per sample at our list price with all reagents included. Okay. Obviously, okay. like you have to still pay the sequencing. That's good. So that's my question. So you gave us a ballpark number. That's good. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thanks. So I think you can ask uh, later some more questions and details. So we'll go on to the next speaker. Yeah. So I'm happy to welcome Stefan, Lisa, Oliver Stefan from Biosciences. And he's going to present us a new sequencer. And I think this has been long waited for because the market has been dominated by one. Uh, short read sequencer technology, which uh, I mean, helped us to make great tools, but now we are going to the basically wide distribution of sequencing in healthcare. So we will see if this would help us. Or can I share my screen? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, okay. I'm sure. Ah, here we go. Stefan, we look forward to what your promising new sequencer can do for us. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Oliver Stefan. I'm the district uh, sales manager for Element Biosciences. Element Biosciences, it's uh, the new kit on the block in the sequencing scene. And I have the challenge now to present you within 15 minutes the uh, technology. I will not make that happen <laughs> in detail, of course, but um, I have a booth over there. And if you have some questions to, that go into the details, feel free to visit me and I will can will be able to explain you some of the details. So 
basically what is element bioscience so um when i was looking into new sequencing t uh, technologies last year i came over on that um yeah uh, article from genetic engineering and biotechnology news headline with all dogs new tricks uh, was <laughs> very interesting and then when i looked a bit more into that i found these three guys over there these are the founders of uh, element biosciences it's molly hay mike previtt matt callenger so internally we don't call them dogs you can understand it's the three m's and all of the three uh, three guys they have a very very intense experience within the NGS uh, field. So all of them work for companies like Illumina, Pack Bio, and they know very, very precisely how NGS works and where the pain points are. And this is also where the name from the company comes from. Um, our three founders, they have identified at the end uh, six different elements uh, where they thought it's worth to improve. Um, everything started with the instrument itself. So on the um, upper left side, you can see the Aviti system itself. Um, it's an extremely flexible instrument, very stable. And the goal here was to create a box that really serves the needs of small and medium throughput customers. That means what we have designed is, um, is an instrument that is able to hold two different flow cells that can be run independently. So basically in the morning, you can start the left flow cell. In the afternoon, you can start the right flow cell. The flow cells have completely independent fluidic systems, so there is no um, real interaction between the flow cells. And the only shared compartment is the imaging system, but this is not sacrificing the time. So very stable instrument, very efficient, very, very flexible. And then they looked into some other elements. So one of the elements, and this is, to me, it was a bit of a surprise because the key element of that um, whole workflow is the flow cell itself. The flow cell itself is able, um, is coated with a surface chemistry that is created in an extremely low background. And is also able to hold different types of um, targets. It's not only DNA, it's also able to hold proteins or cells at the end. So from beginning on, this whole instrument was not designed as a sequencer only. What we will see in the uh, next year, in the next month, is that we will come up also with some protein-based applications that can be run on the same instrument where you do, as of today, the sequencing. So this will become very, very exciting. Um, but for now, we are speaking about sequencing. And here's the big advantage of that flow cell that we have an extremely low background, giving us, together with our sequencing chemistry, creating a very high signal, an extremely superior noise-to-signal ratio. And this enables us to have an extremely efficient and accurate base calling, creating very high... Um, quality reads. So on our specifications, we say something about more than 90% of the reads are above Q30. We constantly overachieve that. And we are very confident to have also Q40 values in a range of uh, 80%. So very nice. Um, the other thing um, our company looked into was uh, the implementation of existing library preparations. I mean, the best sequence in the world doesn't help you if you have to set up a complete new workflow in the lab to create your libraries. So basically what we came up is a very easy um, and quick um, conversion protocol for existing Illumina libraries. Basically the message is as long as you have a library with um, a standard P5, P7 adapter, um, you can run it on the Illumina. So without any big challenges here. Um, and the other thing we looked into is the amplification of the different library molecules on our sequencing slide. So Illumina is using a bridge, bridge PCR to, oops, <laughs> what happened? So, a bit confused now. Okay. <laughs> So I have some issues here with the internet connection. Ah, here we go. 
Okay. So, um, yeah, I was interrupted when I was started to speak about the DNA amplification. So making our polonies on the slide. So Illumina is calling it clusters. We call it polonies. And here we set up a system which is based on a rolling circle amplification. And this is contributing very much to the fact that we um, nearly see no optical duplicates. We are here in a range of 0.5% or something, and that we are not introducing errors into the sequencer because with the cluster PCR, the challenge is always when you're introducing an error in the very beginning of the cluster generation, this error will be propagated through the whole. Um, <laughs> okay. So give me a second. So basically, the, 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 the cluster PCR is a little bit um, prone by sequencing errors introduced in a very early stage. And in consequence, um, sequencing uh, PCR errors during the bridge PCRs are, will be showed up in the sequencing data. This is not happening uh, with the rolling circle amplification. Um, during a rolling circle amplification, we are copying it over and over from the same molecule. And that means that um, even if you are introducing an error, this error showing up in the polony is more or less random uh, and will not be shown up in the data later on. Yeah, yeah. so I have issues with the internet connection. It's simply not stable. Okay, here we go. Okay, so let's start um, to go a little bit into the details. So I will cover that only very, very briefly. As mentioned, if you have questions on that, and we can easily have a discussion on my booth and we can go into the details. So basically, this is the workflow we are um, offering at the moment for the library preparation to make them compatible with the RBT. Basically, uh, the vast majority of our customers is using the so-called ADAPT workflow, which means that you can simply use your existing library prep. Where you can simply use your existing library prep. And the only thing we are doing is we make the Illumina library single-stranded. And um, we ligate the so-called splint oligo, and then we are compatible with the RVT sequencer. The whole workflow here, the turnaround time is something like 10 minutes, so easy to do. And the total time of that conversion step just takes something like, I know, 45 minutes for the standard workflow. And it's easy to automate. And what we will see later in the next year is that we will have this step completely shifted on the instrument so that you can directly load an existing Illumina library. Yeah, try to connect again. And yeah, this is the main um, workflow at the moment our customer base is using. The next step um, then is for us to develop own kits. We have already some kits and we also see third party um, companies like NEB, like um, uh, some, some other big players on the market like Watchmaker setting up or building um, uh, library preparations directly native for Avid. Okay. And then when the sequence is done on the RVT, um, the output file is a simple fast queue. So you can simply use your existing bioinformatics pipeline to analyze the data coming from the sequencer. So very straightforward. So it's a real plug and play solution. Okay. So here in the next slide, um, you can see the way we are doing the rolling circle amplification. Basically, um, 
we put our libraries on our sequencing slide and then we start with the rolling circle amplification and then we are copying over and over from the initial molecule and we end up with something like thousand copies of the library molecule on the slide and then these thousand copies are forming a kind of library cloud and we could that's what we call um polony <laughs> this is Okay, the big advantage of this um, this technology is, as mentioned, we don't have PCR errors that we are seeing during the sequencing, and the other advantage is that we don't observe optical duplicates. Um, optical duplicates, as mentioned, are in a range of something like 0.5%. Uh, okay. Uh, no, it would be nice. We don't know what's causing the issue. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Sure. So apologize for that, but now I really need a slide to explain a little bit more in detail the technology. Yeah. <laughs> Today the electronics are against us. Yeah, so it's humans, things happen. Humans versus machines. <laughs> <laughs> we always lose. Okay, just let me double check. Here we go. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's just try see. We are there now. Yeah.
Okay. Good. So here we are now. So um, maybe I can start again uh, describing the drawing circle amplification. So basically what we are doing, we are creating thousand copies of the initial library prep molecule, uh, library molecule. And then we are ending up um, with um, these kind of polonies. So we have a surface primer attached to our slide, and then this surface primer holds this DNA polony or library polony. Okay. Um, and then the sequencing itself is going to happen. So what we are doing, I will not go into that, uh, into the details here. What we are using is a kind of um, fluorescent dye. It's a fluorescent core that holds a long flexible arms or a number of long flexible arms. And at the end of these flexible arms, you will find the um, DNTPs you want to uh, detect. So it's a DATP, DCTP, DGTP, and um, DTTP. And bottom line is that this chemistry is creating a very high um, signal intensity. And in the same time, we don't need too much concentration of our dyes. And this is uh, contributing very much to the fact that our sequencing costs are really low. And then the other thing is that we separated the incorporation of the nucleotide from the detection itself. And this gives us some very significant advantages uh, when it comes to um, phasing and prephasing effects. Because what we can do is, with this technology, we have the chance to remove the dyes extremely efficiently from the colony. Um, that in consequence, we have no phasing or dephasing effects, which is showing up especially right after homopolymers. So, um, the main principle is really to um, use our dyes and then we detect the first base right after the sequencing primer. And this technology here is based on the situation that all the different homopolymer arms that hold the DATP or DCTP, whatever, are bound on different positions on the polony. And this binding is extremely stable. And is not detecting any sequencing error, um, um, amplification errors that might happen during the rolling circle amplification. So we are very, um, have a very stable dye here, very intense. And then in the next step, we do the imaging. And then later on, we are incorporating natural nucleotides without any modification. So it's a very, very efficient step for nucleotide incorporation. And these are the different chemistries we are offering at the moment. We have a 2 by 75, 2 by 150, and 2 by 300. And all these chemistry can be run on different flow cell sizes. So we have medium, high, and low output flow cells for the different chemistries, enabling our customers to use the flow cell that is really needed um, for their specific demand. Okay. Um, I mentioned already that we have a very high signal to noise ratio, and this is enabling us to use very low concentration of the fluorescent dye. Basically, um, we have a 100 fold reagent reduction um, for the fluorescent dye, and the fluorescent dye is always the cost driver of sequencing chemistry. That means we are extremely competitive here when we compare to single uh, sequencing by synthesis. In fact, uh, in, in fact, we are yeah fourfold, uh, four times less um, on the price compared to other competitors on the market. Another thing is we preserve the color purity, um, disabling phasing and prephasing effects. And this ends up at the end with very low error rates right after homopolymer stretches, for example. Here's an example of different homopoly poly uh, homopolymer stretches, starting from four bases up to 20 the nine bases, and then we looked at the error mat, uh, total errors right after a homopolymer stretch. And for the standard SPS chemistry, you can see error rates going up to 10% right after homopolymer stretch. With the chemistry we are using, we stay relatively stable in the range of 1% maximum. So and this is contributing very much to the data quality. Bottom line is with less data, with less coverage, we see better results. And this is also something described by a publication from Google Health. So basically on the x-axis, you can see the coverage um, of a whole genome sequencing experiment. 
and versus on the y-axis the total errors that have been observed. And what you can see at 15x, element bioscience chemistry is creating something like 100,000 total errors compared to an Illumina sequencer. We are seeing here already 150,000 errors. When you go up to 30x, these error total error numbers um, yeah, come together, ending up with 50,000 approximately. But message here is again, with less sequencing data, you get comparable results. And this is also observed by some other experiments. This is data from MIT, uh, where they sequenced some dog exomes and they compared a 30x whole genome dog um, um, sequencing versus a low coverage. What you can see here is the concordance between the low coverage sequencing experiment versus the 30x whole genome in the dog. And in red, you can see the element bioscience data, in black is Illuma, Illumina NovaSeq data. And what is very clear is that the concordance versus from low pass versus um, 30x is very, very high with the element sequencing stuff. This is more obvious when you look only at the heterozygous sites. And here again, comparison uh, uh, concordance is very, very high in the range of 98.5%. Summary and outlook. So the box we are offering right now um, provides very high quality data up to more than 90% of Q30, $5.60 per gigabase, which list price, which translates, translates to $560 uh, per whole genome. We have a throughput of um, 300 gigabases in maximum. And at the moment, you can run two flow cells fully independent from each other, giving you a 600 gigabase throughput per run. And very interesting for many customers is that we guarantee the costs of the reagents for the lifetime of the instruments. That means if you buy today, five years time, maybe you still have the instrument and then you will get the price from today. Another thing that was important, we have full ecosystem compatibility. That means that existing Lumina libraries can be run easily on the sequencer. And then I mentioned already, it's an um, multi-omics instruments by default. Uh, so in the next year, you will see that we are coming up with some new applications, making use of our very, very flexible surface chemistry on the slides, which enables us to um, run protein assays or cell capture assays. And this is something we are looking into at the moment. And I can foresee that we will have the first product line coming up in Q1 and Q2 covering these technologies. Another thing is targeted sequencing directly on slide. That's also something we are looking into at the moment. Also a very interesting approach. Let's see how this goes. Yeah, that's it. Sorry for the interruptions and the bad internet connection. Things happen, but I hope I can, I was able to pass my message a little bit. And if you have questions, please come by and we can have a discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Oliver. Well, yeah, was, you did a great job instead of the, despite of the weaknesses. <laughs> no so problem. One question I think we should give him as a reward, although we are late in time. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, it's very welcome to have you for the editor. I was wondering whether you the price, so that's quite comparable to Illumina. That's something you're going to have to be pushing to take that will be a huge selling point. And the second one is the variant calling. What you say is also across the variants. Is that any comparison there? Um, so especially when you look at, um, so there, there's a great concordance to existing instruments. So when we do the comparison, um, we have um, concordance of more than 99%. So that's extremely comparable. On top, we have the big advantage that during the due to the rolling circle amplification we do, we are able to support insert sizes up to 2 kb. And this gives big, big advantages when it comes to indel calling, pseudogenes, things like that. So that's a very big benefit. And on top, you mentioned it, we are extremely competitive when it comes to price. So we have that low reagent costs uh, with $5.60 per gigabase, which is pretty unique. And this will stay constant over the next uh, years for sure for the lifetime of the instrument. So no price increases and um, the instrument price itself, we are moving here in the range of $289,000. 
Um, so I think we are competing here very well with all the low and mid uh, size sequencer and shop sequencers on the market. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thanks.